Dilovan, how you doing? Thank you so much, I'm doing great. All right, welcome to the show. Have we met before? Uh, yeah, I think once in the book fair. Uh, uh, it was a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. You've been busy. Very busy, yeah. Why did you choose this life of busyness? Well, it's it's been a it's, it's been my childhood dream. So can you get the microphone up? All right, it? is higher, it good now? Higher, no, higher. Better. Higher. Better. Yeah, that's good. All right. Yeah. So what's up? Uh, uh, you've been busy. Why did you choose this busy life? Well, it's always been a dream, and I think it's uh, it's always been a dream of mine to become an architect. And when I became an architect, I was like, what the hell did I do to myself? <laughs> because um, I think it's it's very hard to be an architect today, uh, at this time, where how the global warming is shaping up and it's uh, it's taken over like the whole attention globally. Um, if you, to, to your surprise or probably, uh, half of the CO2 emissions in the US and around 40% uh, globally is uh, emitted by buildings. Uh, they use up to 40% of the energy. That's uh, being an architect today. Is I think uh, poses a huge role on our shoulders uh, because of what the world is going to have, uh, how the world will be, and and the next centuries. It's it's all going to be shaped by the buildings that are being built and designed today. So where do you live right now? Um, as I told you, I have one foot in Erbil and the other in Budapest what uh, you, right now. <laughs> what are you doing in Budapest? Um, I'm doing masters and I'm working as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a small studio in Erbil. Is it good now? It's good now. <laughs> are you sure? Yeah. All right. So I have a small studio, a small architectural design studio here in Erbil and in Budapest. Uh, we don't do just architectural design. We do interior design, landscape. Um, we also do product design as well and uh, furniture. So we do everything uh, that is related to architecture. But why did you choose to go to Budapest to study? Um, there was a very good university, and uh, it's called Budapest University of Technology and Economics. They're very technical, and uh, like being an architect, like architecture is like not just uh, science, it's not just engineering, it's also art. And, and, and architecture here in Kurdistan, um, you don't learn, and like you don't learn enough of both. Yeah. Um, and if you learn anything, like I, I almost self-taught myself, and because you always have to learn more and more um, so learning here was not enough technically uh, also although you could get a lot of like uh, like let's say art insights because most of the resources online is from the US uh, like the, at least the things that I taught myself and they're mostly uh, connected to is the microphone good why is it falling I have no idea like, yeah okay all right um, so is it good so uh, Self-teaching myself, I thought uh, I wasn't being taught technically enough, so I tried to go to a very good technical university, and I ended up in Budapest, and now I'm so working there studying, as well. You're studying masters there. What are you doing? I'm doing masters there, and I'm working as well. Because I told you, I established a small studio. How do you speak English so well? Uh, I I learned as a child. Uh, I spoke English before I spoke. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah. Wow. How? What? There's got to be some explanation. What? Well, I had. I don't know, it's a long story. Like, uh, I, like, let's say household uh, situation was... Affluent? Uh, yeah, <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, I spoke English as a, at a very young age, so I end up with this right now. That's cool. Uh, thank you. So, you obviously have a lot of passion for, for this. Like, you kind of become like a mini celebrity here in, in your Instagram. Like, you uh, got lots really. of followers. You, uh, you describe yourself as this, experimental architect and designer, yeah. spatial bard? Yeah. What does that mean? Uh, like, I believe that architecture should deliver a distinct and memorable um, experiences to any activity that you do. Mm -hmm. So by spatial bard, I mean, I create like, a, 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 to do my best at our studio, we do our best to create uh, memorable and poetic spaces and memorable, uh, like you do, so, like right now you're speaking on the radio. If I design this space, I'll try to give you a memorable experience of speaking on the radio and I'm just sitting on an up, sitting upright on a table and talking for you and for the guest and for the management. I try to deliver experiences through the spatial design. So this is what I mean with the spatial board. That's so cool. I mean, wow. You, you look like you find your passion. I mean, yeah, cool. I'm so excited about these kinds of people that are so successful. That we're supposed to benefit, hopefully we'll benefit from them. Of course. Thank you. 
So tell us, what do you design exactly? Do you design like office buildings or what? Uh, we generally design every project we're commissioned. Um, we were recently commissioned um, a couple projects in, uh, in uh, Erbil and Duhok also. Um, one of uh, our recent projects is uh, the design of Mr. Erbil, a gentleman house. Um, and also the Munchies Bistro at Empire, we almost, it's almost done. Uh, also the Beverly's Nail Spa, we, uh, that was done like long time ago, almost a year ago now. Are these new buildings? Uh, actually, these were uh, interior designs. Oh, okay. Yeah, we've designed, uh, like as architecture, we've designed um, restaurants. We take part of a lot of competitions uh, globally. We designed um, a project in Switzerland. It was uh, called The Other City. It was part of a competition. We also won a competition for the future homes of Hungary. Um, it was like a small project to, vi to envision how the, uh, the future homes of Hungary should be like. Um, like it's a huge list I could are you well, alone just who does lucky. this with you uh, I have a couple partners one from Holland the other one from Peru I was about uh, to say your wife because your wife is here my wife helps me a lot in everything I do she does she's the biggest part of my studio she actually I would say she made it wait what do you mean exactly is she an architect she's not an architect but she helps me almost in everything I do like I always she's more than a manager she takes care of everything that is my paperwork uh, design decisions we make, we usually show it to her and, and what she thinks about it. Dang, we know who the boss is then. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, you're very optimistic about the future? Because you talked about all these different challenges and stuff like that, about how, oh my God, the world's ending because of hurting our environment so badly. Are you optimistic that you're making better buildings that are environmentally friendly? Here, especially in Erbil? Um, Personally, I'm not optimistic about how build, the building industry is going, especially in Kurdistan. Um, I think how the architectural community is dealing with buildings is very, very responsible. Yes, I said it. Um, I hold the architectural community responsible for the mess that our beautiful cities look like. Um, the other day I saw a very, uh, li like a, 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 a landscape picture of some nature and I thought it was Kurdistan. And to my surprise, when I was reading the caption, it said California. And I, it got me thinking that our nature is very alike to cities that almost every Kurd loves to visit. But why does it seem or look very, uh, let's say, ugly and uh, like uh, visually unpleasing? Um, it's mostly because of the architecture that we build. It's not just irresponsible to the environment. It's not just irresponsible to local architecture, the architecture that was built hundreds of years ago uh, in, in the region, which I think a lot more responsible and responsive to the traditions we have to, to even to the environment so uh, I think the art like we architects are responsible for how the the, uh, the our cities look like here and there's a lot of ways to, to create a building that is not just sustainable but mo mostly regenerative and we do have all the resources in Kurdistan to make that happen but I think it's uh, it's just the professionals are not being uh, responsible enough to do that so where you use the word ugly where do you uh, say it's ugly here. Um, I say ugly in terms of how irresponsible it is and responsive to all the things that it should be responsive to. For example, it is not responsive to the climate and it depends. For example, you, you cannot, uh, I, I dare you to live at your home without using um, ACs. Uh, what is that? What is that related to? And uh, most of people, like uh, when I say ugly, I do not mean the term ugly that in terms of only visually unpleasing because that's not the issue anymore. Uh, architecture should not be, uh, it's, it's not about aesthetic anymore. It's not about uh, the f design fees anymore. It's not about economics. It's not about uh, justice anymore. It's only about the climate change. This is the global issue today. And if we're not acting, we may not feel it in Erbil because we're away from the sea, uh, but it will hit us soon when, when the world is changing because we're like even industry wise, we don't have this big industrial line. So we do not feel the harmness of the climate change at Erbil. But w when we would, because at the rate that we're building, it, 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 it will hit us very soon. So we should be very responsive to the climate. Okay. Which building you would want to take down here in Erbil and build it again? You said, man, that building is a waste of... Um, to be honest, I'll not, be, I'll not say 100% of the buildings. But I would say most of the buildings, there's, there's very good examples and very good buildings in the city. Give me, give me the good ones. To be honest, 
like give me the best just ones. just passing by the citadel and looking at the houses that are built there you look at the fenestration the openings and everything in it it's very responsive to the climate everything the materials used the way they built it the layers of the walls uh, even visually like everything about it is responsive to the city and to the climate of the city um, unlike the buildings that are being built in like newly and recently but uh, we we do have very good uh, like let's say the the youth of the youth generation of architects I have a very uh, let's say I'm a little bit optimistic at least I try to be uh, so wait though you're saying only in the citadel the homes there well I told you like there is a couple buildings like here and there give me the names to be honest, I only like the Citadel in Erbil. So you, you don't approve of the Empire complex? The Empire is, is well designed, okay. uh, at least visually. Uh, the quality of the buildings are very good and very neat. Okay. I've been there myself. Uh, I love it. So then what don't you but love? But again, uh, glass towers. Glass towers are vampires of, of energy, and this is exactly what I don't like. Huh. So we should not have glass towers. Um, is it working? Yeah, it's working. You just have to play with the hair. No, right? no, we don't need it. Um, yeah, all right. Is this okay? It's fine. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, I do hate glass towers a lot. Um, towers shouldn't be built that way. At, but look at the world. Everywhere there is a glass towers here and there. So then should we do like the world or should we do something else? It should be. I told you, it should be responsive to, it should be responsive to the environment. And we should be... This is at least what I believe about architecture. We should be very less dependent on energy. Um, and what I believe... So glass is, is not good. Sorry. Glass, glass is not good. Not always. At least the ratio used like enormously not good. Um, like imagine... Uh, let's talk about like sustainable architecture uh, and how I do not think that it's the solution anymore. Um, uh, what sustainable architecture is, or, or like sustainability in general, it says you use your uh, resources of energy without compromising the future needs and the future use of the future generation. Uh, let's imagine that as having a glass of water, you pass it to a lot of people sitting. Each one takes their, their share of that water. And let's imagine that is the uh, non-renewable resources of the planet. Eventually, this will run out of water and our resources will eventually run out. And with the climate change rate today, I don't think uh, sustainable architecture is even helping anymore. And I think uh, regenerative architecture should be the solution where you regenerate energy and the building should regenerate, should give back to the community, not only in terms Ooh. of, yeah, not only in terms of uh, energy, but also in terms of how can a building create energy? It's I'm, not a tree. No, uh, it can actually. Uh, when how? you have, there is a lot of, uh, like there is a lot of systems uh, w uh, like for energy saving, there is like uh, active energy saving, which depends on technology, and there is uh, our mechanical systems, and there's the passive energy saving systems. A and by using uh, like a comp like uh, a combination of both, you can create a, a net zero house, which uh, which the in the input of energy is equal to the output. But in regenerative architecture, the output of energy is more than the input. Bec like for example, you give back, let's say in terms of energy, you give back to the grid, you give power back to the grid, you produce more power than you use. And you also, in terms of food, you have more, uh, more vegetation, edible vegetation in your landscape of the building, more than the things that you eat or the residents of that building. And you also sell that. So isn't, that isn't that idea expensive though? No, it's not expensive at all. Uh, it's, it's probably, uh, maybe it will be a little bit expensive at the initial cost of any building, but on the running cost, on the long run, you save a lot of money because you don't just save a lot of money, you save uh, a lot of, uh, like, you save the environment a huge deal of, uh, let's say, uh, of the climate change. Uh, if you guys are joining us, this is Architect Dilovar right here. He is trying to change the world through his uh, passion of architecture. He um, is studying in Budapest. He, Budapest. he has opened a company for architecture and you're busy with projects you're doing here. Um, so you obviously are a, a very big asset. Do you plan on continuing to living here or taking your talent somewhere else?
Um, I believe that being here is a blessing, uh, honestly, aside from all the other things. And one of the things that pushes me to be here and to strive to help the community and also for myself to achieve my dreams is, is being uh, like part of my business. The huge part will be here because even the problems I talked about, how we are missing a huge deal of architecture in the city, um, I think I'll be here the most, most of the time. But I also think that I should have um, like some small studios every here and there to have to be commissioned more projects and to show the world what we can do um, locally, not just locally, but also globally. A um, few years ago, Zara, Zaha Hadid. Yeah, Zaha Hadid. Zaha Hadid died, she passed away, and she was a very powerful influence in the world of architecture. She True accomplished that. ridiculously things, um, making all these amazing buildings throughout the world, like multi-million dollar buildings. And uh, when she passed away three years ago, you wrote this about her. You said, rest in peace to the mother of architecture. You're not even technically gone. You left not only a tangible touch, though a physical trail of a whole new generation of architecture and engineering. Your spear is hovering around every part of the world that you presented, that you present, that you presented a gift wrapped landmark to that each city will forever thank you for. Who has influenced you to be who you are? Is she one of them? To be the person that you are today? She's a huge influence um, as a person and as an architect. Um, what was great about her? Tell us a person who doesn't know nothing about architecture like us. All right. Um, in the beginning of our talk, I told you that I believe, I personally believe that architecture should leave uh, distinct and memorable experiences to the users and doing their activities. And uh, if, the, if architecture doesn't do that to the user, then it's not, then we have failed to deliver architecture. What Zaha Hadid has done through her journey and through her career is to create these out of the world geometries and out of the world architecture that architecture itself didn't know before her. And the way that she changed the construction and the building technology through her, through her like extraordinary structures is, is completely unique and that's what I uh, like that's what I upload for her um, that's the reason like not necessarily what I personally think of her architecture but as a person she was very inspiring um, there is a huge what I appreciate uh, the most um, about architecture and architects are those who care about the environment because as I told you earlier it's not about aesthetic anymore it's not about the financial income or outcome of the buildings it's not about the legislations it's, it's mostly about how we can build efficiently today and how we do not uh, ruin the beautiful cities that we do have we still have chance to make our city look beautiful right i definitely think so um I, uh, there's a funny thing i was talking to a friend the other day and i was uh the service life of our buildings are uh, rather short than they should have been um, so we do have the chance to create great buildings because uh, like every now and then we have to renovate a new buildings, uh, renovate existing buildings. Um, so I do think that it's very possible to make the city great. Uh, starting by small units, I'm not talking about a huge urban developments. I'm talking about the small units that I and other architects are usually commissioned from small houses to small office buildings to small commercial units. It's, it's very possible to to make the city efficient through these small units. If I do the small unit efficient, the other does another one, then you do have, like this is what the community is consisting of. Have you uh, have you met Basma Abdurrahman? Yeah, she's a good friend of mine. Wait, 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 wait don't say a girlfriend of mine. Wait, wait. That's I said she's a good friend of mine. Oh, I thought you said a girlfriend of mine. I was like, your wife is here. No, she's a, she's a great a friend. A good friend of mine, a yeah, great yeah, friend yeah. of yours. Yeah. Because she has an, a, a similar movement. Yes, she does. We, uh, she, she's a great, she's very inspirational. She was the first one to establish um, a green building consultancy. And I really like appreciate what she's doing. Uh, she is doing a great job. But as I told you, uh, what I personally think is we should start building regenerative buildings rather than just um, sustainable buildings. And because it's, it's not going to help us anymore, not today. But uh, in Kurdistan, we do miss that uh, at the moment uh, due to the responsibility of, of the architectural community again. Architect Delavan is here to join us, to talk to us about what is the future of designing in the cities. He's going back and forth, like he said, he has one foot here and one foot in Europe and trying to uh, make it here through this world. Tell us about your personal life now a little bit. Were you born all your life? You lived in Erbil or where were you? 
Uh, I, I've lived in multiple cities through uh, my life. I was born in Baghdad. Um, I lived uh, like uh, I, the, the situation here was horrible at the time. So my parents insisted on me having good education. So they sent me off to Baghdad. They were they weren't able to go there, so I had to be there alone. You went with to my Baghdad school alone? Yeah, with my grandparents. When was uh, when was this? What year was this? I was in the 90s. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah. I'm 26. I know you. You're gonna ask that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and then I moved to Erbil, <laughs> and uh, now I'm off to to Europe. So you're between uh, Europe and Erbil, right yes, here. Definitely. What have you done um, for fun when you have a chance? What do you do for fun? Uh, design is is a very fun job for me. Designing has always been the fun part of my life. Um, we I, like I love playing basketball on my free time. But unfortunately, I haven't played in a long time. But uh, I'm trying to, like, every time I have, like, a small free time, I make yeah. sure that I entertain myself. You said uh, you're married? Yes. For how many years, you said? We've been married for two years now. Um, oh, no, that's not the right music. <laughs> Are we there yet? Okay. Tell I knew us, this was coming. Tell us about how you two lovers met each other. You uh, have to do with the sword. No, no, no. Deep <laughs> voice. Change your voice. I can't do that. All right, can't so do that. we we I have to whisper. We've almost <laughs> grew up together. Uh, our families knew each other. Oh, so uh, like it was you know when you meet the one you you said you were getting married. So when you meet the one, you exactly know what's going to happen. You get married. Yeah. So this is what happened with us. So you met her when you were like eight years old, and you knew right away you mm. wanted to marry her. No, no, not that's not the case. I said our families knew each other. And yeah. That's how we met. Well, how, when did you know? You know. When I. Uh, I knew when I proposed that she's the one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you've known her all your life? Not all my life. Most of your life. Come on, Nur, this is not why we're here. <laughs> this is not why you called me. <laughs> all right, fine. <laughs> You're not comfortable with the love talk, huh? Um, very comfortable, but like, <laughs> this is not why you called me. No, that's all good. We want to get to know you, that's why. We don't want to just talk about architecture. We want to know about what makes you. Because the thing is, is like, the, the cool thing about a city is we so many different people come out of it, right? Definitely. People who are so, like, they've gone different directions. So I'm trying to understand how you became you. How did the Levi became the Levi? What was your surrounding? And what was your, you know, personal style? What was your personal story? To make you who you are today, because it's hard to love the environment when you're born and raised in Iraq, right? I completely agree. Um, I love how you view the community and how you view architecture, it's definitely the people that shape uh, how our architecture uh, outlook and outcome. And you thinking about the individuals is, is very, like it's exactly how people should think uh, architecture and how it is composed. Um, to be honest, like I don't know what to say for uh, how I, like let's say I- Are your I parents grow, architects? Um, I'm the only, not only architect in the family, but the only engineer in the family. Nah, she and I even. <laughs> yes, that's that's the case. Okay. Yeah, um, but I read a lot. Uh, I make like I'm always. I told you I self-educated myself a lot uh, through my uh, education. I had a couple professors. Uh, they were very good. Uh, what are their names? They helped me a lot. Um, Dr. Salah, Dr. Salah Hadin. Yeah, seen Dr. Salah Hadin Fishdari, Dr. Mahmoud Khayat. Uh, Shout they outs. Were, yeah, they were great professors. They always helped me. And uh, through my journey, I told you, I tried to read a lot. So I always learned about the problems that are shaping up our today's world. And, and it was very concerning for me, uh, like how, how the world has become to due to our responsibility as, as a human like as as mankind and like look at look at statistics in 1900 there was only around uh, 1 billion 1.6 billion and in the 2050 we we're gonna hit 9 billion uh, benchmark this is a scary really and what we're doing to the environment with our responsibility not just only not just architecturally but even in every way that um, we are living in our communities is just horrible so reading has initiated this, uh, let's say, responsive, responsivity, if that's a word, uh, in my head. And I try to like build at least responsibly through every little project that I'm commissioned. If, somebody building, if somebody's building a house now, what would be the number one advice you would tell him so that it becomes a good house? Um, do not think of uh, what you have to 
pay or what you have, what you want to do today. Think of how you want to live in your house the rest days of your life because this is going to be your companion and how much you want to save and how much you want to contribute not just to the world but to your family. And what their... steps, what things should you do to this house in order to do that? Um, personally, at our studio, I can tell you our, our experience. Um, what we do we ha our, through our design process, uh, prior to the design and the concept of, of phase, we do this intensive study where we educate the client how their building and how their vision of that project uh, should look like architecturally and how efficient it should be. Uh, we also educate them what is the role that is going to do in their life. Uh, that is through the design phase. Um, and I do think like we do include the, the clients as much as possible. After that, where I don't see it happening in Kurdistan, there's this post-occupancy evaluation where uh, you make sure the occupants of the building, uh, whatever building it is, not necessarily the residents of it, but all the users, how they evaluate the design and the design team after they have used that building. And this would help a lot, uh, not just the community, not just the government, uh, but also us to better understand how our, our designs are affecting the lives of the users. What's the name of the company that you created? Um, it's Dad, the Love and the Law Architecture and Design. Dad. Yeah, double D-A-D. Okay, so you got Dad and you have an office here or how does it work? Um, yeah, I have a small studio, as I told you, here in Erbil and the other in Budapest. Uh, we're commissioned smaller projects mostly. Um, after the crisis, we were mostly commissioned with uh, like interior designs the most, uh, you know why, yeah. uh, the economical crisis. And, uh, but we do not stop, we do have this uh, competition lines going on. We do take competitions, we do take part of competitions every here and there. And uh, can people contact you for like services? Yes, definitely, the, you, you have my website uh, on the... Dad.eu? Yeah. Ddad.edu. That's easy. Yeah. Thank you. Ddad.edu. You can contact them where, right there at the Lovar, and uh, ask them for any kind of consultancy or any kind of um, services that they can offer. Uh, you have your phone number there. You got your Iraqi and your Budapest number. Uh, I really love that thing that you did in Korea. Thank you so much. I did it with a friend of mine. I like how it represents our culture. Yeah, we try to be very efficient at that project. What uh, is the building exactly? It's a. Uh, when the client came to us um, at that time, they wanted to build uh, at uh, at Koya Teaching Hospital. That's it. Of Koya Teaching Hospital. Are you talking about that one? This Can one. Can I see? Yeah. A uh, hospital? No, that's not the hospital. There's Koya Teaching Hospital, and there's usually this overcrowdedness going on in the and the corridors. Uh, and the friend of ours has come to us, me and my other friend and uh, commissioned us to do it. What the client exactly wanted, uh, they wanted to lessen the crowdness of the hospital. Uh, they needed to build a prey house, but what they wanted to do is invite everybody from all religions and all, like everybody who comes to the hospital, regardless to their religious background. So they didn't name it a prey house, so they named it the house for all. Uh, and what this house is like, it has two masses for you know, it's responsive to the tradition, so we do have this woman uh, resting area and the men resting area. It has this uh, facilities for ablution and like cooling off f with water features and you could rest there. It's a, I think the, even the execution engineers have done a great job making that happen. Nice. Yeah. It's, it's Shout really out to my friends who did it. It's, re it's really, really cool. Yeah. Um, I, like, I like how you, you're mixing the modern with, the, with yeah. the culture, with the ancient. Well, that was a long time ago, before I started my own studio. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it was very responsive to the vernacular architecture, but not a lot, uh, just a little bit, let's say. Let's be honest. Yeah. Yes. So thank you so much for joining us, Zilava. This has been uh, an excellent um, interview, getting to know you. Thank you so much for having me. Anything you want to say before we let you go? Just be responsible and responsive to your environment, to the community. And to where you are, it's a, it's a great role on your shoulders, on all of our shoulders, to give back to the community and stop just taking and think of how the whole community is going to shape up after what we decide at, at a short time. So make sure you build responsibly, everyone.
and consult professionals like you before building so that things go right. Hopefully, thank you. Thank you so much. Good luck with everything, bro. Thank you so much, Noor.